Hello YouTube, this is Jesse Ferguson, the Bard of Cornwall, and I'm bringing you today a mandolin introduction slash tutorial. And I will preface this tutorial as I did with my Boron videos, uh, my Boron tutorials, which ended up being my most popular videos, that I am a self-taught musician. I don't know how to read music notation. Uh, I only know things about music theory that are essential to get by in a sort of performing slash jamming situation. So if you want something more technical, then maybe uh, you should look elsewhere. But what I hope to provide here is an absolute bare bones introduction to the mandolin, something that could get you per playing by the end of the video. Um, so, uh, and this is an answer to some requests by my viewers over the years. I've had a number of requests for this. I hesitated a bit because, as I said, I'm self-taught, don't really know a lot of the whole theory, but I have learned what seems to work for me at least. So, um, my history with the mandolin, in case you're interested, I've, uh, this mandolin my father bought for me when I was about 10 years old, something like that. He enrolled me in music lessons and I uh, wasn't too interested in learning all the dry theory behind playing music I wanted to play. And I wasn't too interested actually in the mandolin at the time because I thought it wasn't a cool instrument. My father played the guitar and I was a little bit more interested in that. He bought me one of these without, without asking me and uh, it was an unpopular choice. So it sat in the closet for about 10 years, uh, untouched. And uh, in the meantime, I had asked my father for an electric guitar, which I got a Fender Bullet, and uh, enjoyed that quite a bit. And then I got myself an acoustic guitar. Uh, but around my late teens, I became interested in Celtic music, folk music, of which, uh, in which the mandolin can feature. So I dusted it off, tuned it up, and proceeded to teach myself how to play it. Uh, there was a, one of those old Mel Bay songbooks that you know are included with many instruments you can find these they're sort of done up like a sort of playbill size and they have some songs and some theory etc so i use that taught myself the basic chords that way so that's what my background is been playing for about 10 years seriously um so advice for buying a mandolin if you're at that stage of the game uh again i'm not a huge expert on that my mandolin is a hondo mandolin, I presume made in Japan. I did some Google searching on this mandolin and the company and wasn't able to find very much. Uh, I would recommend this mandolin, but I'm not quite sure if the quality standards of Hondo have gone up or down since this one was produced uh, over 15 years ago. Good brands I've played myself, uh, either from borrowing them from friends or trying them in shops, are Epiphone and uh, Gibson, which Gibson is credited with uh, in inventing basically the modern mandolin, the flat contemporary mandolin. Um, before that there was the the bowlback style mandolin, or sometimes colloquially referred to as the tater bug, because it looks like a potato bug. Um, so this is an innovation by Gibson Guitar Company. And so uh, they have a long lineage in the field and obviously their mandolins would compare favorably with others also out there. How much should you pay for a mandolin? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I usually recommend to people to buy a second-hand instrument of anything they're playing because that allows you to buy a higher quality instrument uh, with still, while still maintaining your, your price point that you're comfortable with. So I would recommend spending, you know, in the area of two to five hundred dollars on a mandolin uh, don't buy the cheapest ones you can find because you'll be disappointed with the quality. And you won't get a nice rich tone, you won't get good quality machine heads, which are these little gizmos that turn the uh, tune the strings, etc. So just look around, see if you can find one used. I would say you should be shooting for the $200 to $500 price range. Of course, you can find some lower than that. I wouldn't advise those, uh, buying those. And you can, of course, find ones that are more expensive, much more expensive, especially if you get custom-made ones. Now, uh, some nomenclature, uh, terminology that you should know so you can follow what I'm telling you. Uh, again, you can find this all on Wikipedia or other places. Um, common terminology for the mandolin. A lot of this also applies to guitars. The head is this area. The head. 
the neck, the body. So just like a person, right? Head, neck, body. Um, this piece of wood here is called the bridge. This little piece of metal comes off, revealing a set of hooks. That's called the tail piece. That's where you hook the strings on. Um, these are machine heads with gears on the back. These, of course, are the strings arranged in two sets. Uh, four sets, or series, as though they're technically called. Uh, so they're tuned the same. The first two are tuned to G. Second two to D. Uh, the third two are to A. And the last series, both to E. G, D, A, E. These are sound holes, of course. Uh, pick, guard. And uh, this is the face, back, and strap. That's your basic terminology. These little wires are called frets. So, uh, should you buy a Florentine style, an F style mandolin, or an A style? Well, the one that I'm holding is called an A style mandolin, uh, which I believe stands for American style. This was the original one. Now you might have seen some, I think Bill Monroe, famous bluegrass uh, mandolin player, uh, plays an A style, uh, an F style, which is Florentine style. And there's a little curl here and a piece that juts off at the bottom. Um, now, does one sound better than the other? Well, most people agree, that I've seen and talked to anyway, that there's no difference in the sound. Um, that little curly cue doesn't add much in terms of tone or anything like that. But what you do get is, more often with the Florentine style, the F-style, you usually see those in higher-end, more expensive instruments. Better craftsmanship, perhaps better tone woods, uh, etc. So, uh, mandolins produced by the same manufacturer with the same materials, if they had A-style versus F-style, you probably wouldn't notice any difference. Uh, so it's worth bearing that in mind. It's more for the looks, it seems. So, that being said, on to playing it. Um, what you want to start off with is playing simple chords, and that will get you playing something right away. I find that, uh, from what I've heard in my own experience, uh, people who teach music, especially to kids, they miss the mark in trying to teach them the complex music theory before they allow them something that they can sort of sink their teeth into immediately. Get them playing a song right away and the kid won't lose interest, right? They won't get discouraged, etc. And probably the same holds true for adults as well. So what I want to do here is give you something you can play with right away. So the majority of the chords that you will use in, say, folk music, the kind of music I play, um, you can play them with two fingers. So very easy. You can look up these uh, chord charts online. You can just type in mandolin chord chart and you'll find all the major ones that you would use. Majors, minors and uh, etc. And sevens, those would be the main ones you would use for folk music and bluegrass. So I'm going to teach you three chords with which you can play maybe 75% of folk songs, um, Celtic, American, whatever, or otherwise. Um, so I'm going to zoom in right here and I'm going to show you your middle finger on the third position of the high E string, the highest string. Pointer finger on the second position of the A string, so like a triangle sort of shape. Strum it, and you've got a G chord, G major. Now there are other ways of playing a G, but for now that's all we need, two fingers. Now don't move your fingers um, in terms of shape, and just bounce them up more towards your own head. In other words, on the D and the A string. So that's middle finger on third position of the A string, and pointer finger on the second position of the D string. And that's C major. So G, and just bounce them up to C. Now the third chord I'll teach you, which allows you to play a full song with the, in combination with the other two, 
is the D major chord, just D. Also with two fingers. So your ring, your middle finger is going to be on second position of the high E string, and your pointer finger. This is how I play it anyway, on the second position of the uh, G string. So you end up with the top and bottom sort of configuration. So that's D. So you have G, C, D. With that combination, you can play a number of songs, including one I'll show you towards the end of the video. Now, how do you hold it? Um, you want to, uh, it's critical that you hold it properly and in a way that's comfortable for you so that you avoid hand cramps. That's one of the major problems, especially if you're trans uh, transferring from guitar to mandolin. You will get cramps in this part of your hand, as well as possibly cramps in, your, in the hand that's holding the pick because of the fast picking, tremolo picking. And this is the part that I found that many other YouTube videos haven't shown enough. I said the same thing in my Boron tutorials, the drum uh, tutorials, that the videos didn't show enough close-ups on how to hold the instrument, how to hold the tipper with the drum, but in this case it's going to be how to hold the mandolin and how to hold your pick. Um, they'll show you from a distance, but I'm going to show you from different angles and really close up, and I'm going to slow it right down, so forgive me if you know this, but you want to uh, get it right, otherwise you'll end up with possibly carpal tunnel syndrome problems or just cramping that impedes your playing. Um, now another thing I'll say there is that you have to find what works for you. You can learn from someone like myself or somebody who knows a little more in the out at the outset, but eventually you are going to work at something that fits your body, if you're a large person, a slender person, tall, etc., big hands, small hands, that all makes a difference. So anyone who says to you that it has to be this way or that way is probably trying to get something out of you, money for lessons, etc., or you know, for you to acknowledge that they are better than you are, something like that. Uh, don't buy it. Find out what works for you and do that. You can get some guidance from people, but ultimately it has to boil down to what works for you. So this is just what works for me. You can take it as such. With your pick, with your uh, fingering hand, this put this hand fingering on the frets. You want to have a straight wrist for the most part. You don't want to have weird angles. You want to have a nice comfortable position like this. And I'll show you that from different angles. Forgive me if I'm coming out of focus here. That's what you're going to have most of the time. Now, sometimes you may switch to palm against palm against the neck. That will be for certain um, sort of melodies you might play, etc. It depends on the song, depends on the part of the song you're playing, and also on your comfort level. So most of the time you want this. Sometimes you may do that. And again, if, if one works for you more than another, that's fine. So palm in, possibly. I prefer, much prefer the straight wrist because if you think of the tendons of your hand uh, originating in your forearm, a straight line will kink them less, right? More comfort over the long haul. So that's what you want to do with that hand. Um, and. Uh, it may sound obvious, but you want to be pressing the strings with the very tip of your finger. Uh, don't be pressing with the flats. And you're going to develop calluses on the ends of each finger. And the hard one to get to work is the pinky. Um, so that's that part. Your thumb will come above a little bit. I don't advise having your thumb come all the way above because for some reason that increases the fatigue in the, palm, in the meaty part of your hand right here. And it also seems to limit your fingering, uh, the nimble action of your fingers. So you want to keep that thumb out, and you create almost a sort of V-shaped grip. And the, the uh, mandolin sits not right at the bottom of it, but up. So that's what works for me anyway. Again, find something that's comfortable for you. Now, the strumming hand, you want to... Keep the mandolin 
at a sort of 45 degree angle from your chest. So if my shoulders are square at you right now, the mandolin is going to be at a 45 degree angle. Tucked under my arm slightly, out to the side a bit, and uh, so if, if there was a line coming straight up my chest, the mandolin would be at about a 45 to it. Why is that? Well, it's just the most comfortable. You can square your shoulders, etc. And it also presents the fingerboard, the neck, to your eyes nicely, so that you're not sort of crouching down, straining your neck to see what you're doing if you're doing something complex on the fingerboard. You want the head of the mandolin, ideally, to be about at the level of your heart. You don't want it way down, you don't want it way up. Again, just to have a natural, easy uh, action of your wrist moving side to side. <coughs> so just a little higher than your elbow. Seems to be natural. The other arm is going to lock that mandolin in. Not, not in a sort of choke hold, but gently anchor it so that it's not bouncing around while you're doing the finger work. So the, the meat of your forearm on your uh, strumming hand, and the same would hold true if you were a lefty, is going to rest on the edge of that mandolin. And depending on what kind of strumming you're doing, you will, uh, this hand, the strum hand, may float freely, not resting at all on the, uh, on the face or the bridge of the, of the mandolin. So if you're doing a sort of more upbeat, uh, sort of wild, loud song, depends on how loud you want it to be, you might just go floating freely. Whereas if you're going in for more controlled picking, flat picking, which is uh, where you pick out the notes of the chords rather than just strumming them, you go like this. That's flat picking as far as I understand it. Then what you're going to want to do there is anchor your hands some, somewhere on the face of the instrument. So what I do is I put that forearm in against the, against the edge of the mandolin and I rest my palm on the back part of the strings behind the bridge. This bridge is that piece of wood here that you see. If you strum the strings on the back side of it, you just get some bizarre sounds. If you strum on the front, you get actually what you're playing. So it doesn't matter if you put anything back here as long as you're not pressing really hard, which might affect the pitch on the, on the front half. But that's where I rest my palm, specifically the bottom edge of my palm right behind the bridge. And what that allows you to do is for the front part of your hand, namely the, uh, the pointer finger and the thumb, to operate freely here and accurately because it's anchored. And I also put my pinky and my ring finger on that pick guard. Just let lightly rest in there. It's not in a choke hold, it's not pressing very hard. You want to have a nice mix in your holding technique of looseness and yet predictability. So you're anchoring things, but you're not really pressing hard because that makes all of your motions uh, rigid. So for finer picking or for picking out uh, melodies on single strings, Same thing for tremolo picking, which is that uh, signature picking style for mandolins. That's just a very quick back and forth rocking with your pick hand. They call it tremolo. At any rate, you would anchor your hand for that somewhat. Now, a piece of advice uh, for any kind of strumming on guitar, mandolin, something like that, you want to move your arm as little as possible, because if you're going to play for an extended period of time, you're just wasting energy. So let your wrist do the work if you can. It's a way to make your, your playing more predictable, therefore more accurate. <coughs> Excuse me. How do you hold the pick? Well, that's another thing that people don't often show. Um, I hold my pick with just my thumb and my uh, pointer finger. 
and I hold them in a, pa in a pattern like that. Try to make them show up a bit more. That's not helping much. Uh, at any rate, that's what it looks like. And you'll notice that I'm not choking up on it really hard. You want to have it firm in there so that it's not going to slip out on you. But not so firm that there's no give in it. You want a little bit of give. And you hold it in slightly like so, like you're making an OK sign. The other fingers you can do with as you will. Usually they would just sort of curl in so that they're out of the way. Or if you're anchoring, then your as I mentioned, those two fingers would probably be anchored on the guitar or the mandolin. And you'll notice one other thing. I play a stubby pick. This happens to be a Jim Dunlop stubby, uh, one millimeter thick. And if you compare it to a standard size guitar pick, which I use for my guitar, <coughs> the stubby is obviously much smaller. Why do I do that? I find it gives me better better uh, control and I like the very sharp tip you can get with the stubby which allows me to do very precise picking in between the strings. Don't forget how crowded the strings are on a mandolin compared to a guitar. There's a lot, eight strings going on in a much smaller space than a guitar neck. So you want precision for getting in there. And I also hold the pick right down to the tip almost. There's a very little bit showing out. And it would be the same thing if I played it with a large pick. I would hold it, choke up on it as they say. Get right down to the pit, the tip. And these are very hard picks. They're a millimeter or more thick, which means there's almost no flex at all in them. Why do I do that? Again, control. Um, you don't have to wonder where the tip of your, your pick is on any given note because it's right there rigid. So if you want a little bit more flexibility, say for those strumming, then you would just ease up your grip a little bit for that. And when you're doing more precise work, you just close it in a bit more. Now that's a bit challenging for you to master at this stage, but eventually you will get there based on your, your playing experience. So, next thing you need to do, now that you know how to hold it, um, Oh, and one other thing about picks, it's not mandatory, obviously, that you play with a hard pick, or a large pick, or a stubby pick. <coughs> what you want, obviously, is something that fits you, is comfortable for you. I do, however, recommend, in any case, that you get picks that have some sort of a raised texture on them. This Jimmy Dunlop has that. My guitar picks all have that. Greater control if you have a little bit of texture on there. Now. Should you use a soft pick or a hard pick? I say hard pick, and a lot of people agree, but uh, the person who I think is basically the, the greatest mandolin player alive right now, Chris Thiele, T-H-I-E-L-E, -E, uh, plays in a band called Punch Brothers. He plays a full-size pick, and it appears to be medium hard. Uh, so, you may want to take his advice over mine. Um, so, strumming the chords, what you want to do is strum the whole thing, obviously, all four, all four sets of strings. Um, a standard pattern that you will use, I use anyway, in folk music is down, just on the top note, on the, on the bass note, as they call it. So I'll show you that a little slower. It's hard to slow it down. This is what it sounds like at full speed. So you hit the open G, then down again, up, that's the basic uh, folky rock and roll slash, uh, slash rock and roll str strum. Um, there are different types of strums, um, but that one would be a major one that I use over and over again. So if you'd like to practice with my videos, 
and that's the one I use <clears throat> a lot of the time. At any rate, those two finger chords that I showed you, you can get a whole chart of those off the internet somewhere. Not every, not every chord can be played with two, two fingers as far as I know. <clears throat> but um, there are more complex ways of playing it, notably bluegrass chords, which you can look into if you're into bluegrass. Now basically they take that G I showed you and they add this on the top. And they slide that around for the C. Now why do they add those other chord, uh, other fingers on the top? So that you can do what they call a, a chop, a chop style strum. Now you could use that in Celtic as well. Um, but basically what you do is you're not actually removing your fingers completely off the strings or muting with your palm, which is another way of achieving a similar effect. Um, you're actually just uh, pressing first and then you release, but your fingers stay over the, over the same frets, which makes it more reliable, right? So you can see my hand actually moving off. And it's actually, it achieves a similar effect to playing reggae style uh, uh, guitar. I don't want to wait till then for your love. Anyway, similar type idea. Percussive. You're playing uh, something similar to what the, the drums play, in other words. So that's, an, that's a, the idea that there was more complicated ways of playing a chord. Um, configurations are out there. I say to start off with, just stick to the simple ones. If you can do it with two fingers, why do it with four? Sounds pretty much the same. Depends on what kind of music you're playing, I guess. Um, so now that you've got the chords down, you can find tables of them online. Um, the next thing you're going to want to do is learn scales. Now, I don't know a lot about music theory, so what I did is I just googled uh, mandolin scales and I would find a scale in the key of the song I wanted to play. Right? So if you're going to play a song in G, you have to learn the G scale. So that's a G major scale. You can say major if you want, you don't have to. Um, so you would want to learn the scales to the common chords that people play songs in, which would be G, C, D, A, uh, E minor perhaps, A minor. Those would be the big ones for folk music. If you learn those scales, you can improvise so uh, melodies, right? So if I wanted to do a, uh, a little melody based on a song I'm playing, <clears throat> like uh, the Log Driver's Waltz, which is a video I have up. Um, did I learn that, that solo from, some, from somewhere? No, I just, made, I just figured it out myself, right? How did I do that? by learning the scale, so you know where the notes will fall if you're playing in the key of, G, of D there. And I did make a little boo-boo, I noticed that. Um, so when people on Facebook ask me for a tab for uh, a solo, I don't have that tabbed anywhere. And if, I ask, if you asked me to play that, that melody tomorrow, it would sound probably a little bit different. Um, that's what knowing the scales can allow you to do. You basically, you sort of half memorize the melodies you play, and the other half is, you know, improvising because you know where the next note should fall. So that's something you should do yourself. You can certainly look up tabs on the internet uh, or sheet music, um, but tabs that I found out there are quite often very, very wrong. Um, so it's almost useless to look up the tabs. It seems like people who do notation maybe know what they're doing a little bit more and they are a little more accurate, but at any rate, that's what you get. So uh, the other thing you should know is about that speed picking, that little tremolo. It's the same thing as uh, any other kind of picking. It's just uh, the key to remember there is that you want a very small motion in your hand. I'll show you what that looks like. And I mean small in the sense of not wasting energy. So 
my hand, my, my pinky is anchored, my palm is anchored, and I'm just moving the wrist slightly. And there's a little bit of hand motion in there too, so you can almost do it just with your hand. Now, some people find it cheesy to put too much of that kind of tremolo into a song. I generally like to play a melody straight, letting the notes ring, and then add a little bit of tremolo uh, as an accent, but that's up to you, obviously. Um, so, a few tips that I've learned over the years. Um, a little tape recorder, or uh, this is a digital, a Sony digital voice recorder. They're great for learning songs by ear. You record the song first, you can play it back as many times as you want there. You can record a song live, you can record uh, something off YouTube, a little, a little bit off YouTube video, and you can also play it back <coughs> at half speed on this. So that's how I figured out songs such as video on YouTube, recorded it, learned it. So is it exactly like Beethoven's version? Probably not, but uh, I'll put it this way, my, my wife and son don't, don't seem to mind. Uh, they're not comparing the two. Uh, so I just learn for fun. I play the music that I, that I enjoy. So you can do complex melodies, bluegrass, Celtic, even classical. Just learn them by ear. It's not that complicated if you just break it down step by step. So a good thing to, uh, to keep how do you learn the scales and learn them well? Um, well, I, uh, I was getting some advice by uh, the mandolin player for a band called the River Thieves in Ottawa. They were on break and I was picking his brain on terms of how to get better at mandolin. Um, a, great, you know, a great time to pick someone's brain, catch the musician on break, maybe buy him a beer and say, uh, you know, can you give me some tips, etc. And what he would do is he would keep his mandolin by the side of the couch. And when he was playing, uh, he would play on the commercials. So he'd pick it up when the commercials were on, and he would do scales nonstop until the commercials were done. And I don't know what his wife thought of that, but at any rate, it seemed to work because the guy was pretty amazing. So you just have to stick with it and uh, keep playing those scales, keep playing the chords until they come easily to you. You don't have to think, oh yeah, where does that finger go for a C chord? Just do them over and over and over again. Uh, play along with some songs, etc. you find on YouTube. Um, a good idea is to pick up, if you haven't already, a digital tuner. I recommend this one, the Korg. I've had two of them so far. Um, and this one, what it also has is not just a tuner, but a metronome. Highly recommend that, a metronome. What do you do with that? Well, you play along with it to improve your timing. You get the idea. It should be a little faster for that song. Um, that's a good idea. Improve your timing. Um, another thing you should do is uh, watch YouTube videos. There are lots of great uh, how-to videos out there, and there are also just a lot of great musicians on YouTube performing. Watch what they do. Watch how they hold the instrument, etc. Those kind of things. A guy you should look up is Chris Thiele. C H R I S T H I L E, and his band is called Punch Brothers as in, you know, a punch with a, a fruit punch, etc. Um, amazing mandolin player. You should check him out. But also just a lot of tutorial videos that are out there. <coughs> There's a website that I used when I was first learning called Folk of the Woods, uh, or Folk of the Wood. At any rate, they have a lot of tutorials online for free. Mandolin, fiddle, banjo, all kinds of things. They're a great website. And uh, so that's, that's pretty much all I have to say about playing mandolin. Um, I recommend this kind of a strap. Uh, I've had some buddies who, uh, convert from, who converted from guitar to mandolin, like myself, and they try to use their guitar strap, but they're way too long. I recommend getting one custom-built, or purpose-built, for mandolin. 
and you put it over only one shoulder and it keeps it just in the right place. You don't even have to hold it. Highly recommended. Um, so here's a tutorial using those three chords I showed you. And it's uh, Mary's Wedding. One, two, three, four. G, C, D. So on the after you finish the verse, you hold that D just a little bit longer. Thanks for watching.